is what we call renal corpuscle. Okay? Now, the renal corpuscle has two things in it. What are the two things that make up the renal corpuscle? You have the glomerular capillaries, which are because you have the renal artery branching so many times and then you have it becoming like capillaries that are within this capsule. And then we have this arterial living. Now look at this. This that we are seeing here, this is a capsule which can be called glomerular capsule. And these inside all these capillaries are the glomerular capillaries, which are collectively called glomerulus. Are we good? So you have the glomerulus being surrounded by the glomerular capsule that was known before as Bowman's capsule. You have the renal artery branching so many times and then the blood arrives right here in the afferent arterial. A for arriving, and the blood leaves in the efferent arterial. So the blood arrives in the afferent and it exits in the efferent. Are we good? Which blood has less waste? Efferent. Which blood has more waste? Efferent. Why would the afferent have more waste than efferent? Because it's not filtered yet in the glomerular capillaries. So this is what we call renal corpuscle. The glomerular capsule with the glomerulus inside. Now right after the renal corpuscle, we have like a duct that's coiled up. And then we have something that goes down and then it starts going up. And then you have something that's coiled up again. <coughs> and then you have something like this. So let's do like this. This, can you notice that this is coiled up? So this is convoluted. Can you notice that whatever was filtered out of the blood, whatever was filtered out of these capillaries will end up in this capsule right here. If you stay within, if you are the blood and you stay within the capillaries, you live in the efferent arterio. Now, if you are small enough to lick from the pores you have in these capillaries, you will end up in this capsule. Now, these capillaries, they have pores, which means that what is the type of that capillary? Penetrated. If it was sinusoid capillaries, you'd have big gaps and then you'd see cells. But we know we cannot see cells like red blood cells in our urine. Consequently, these are penetrated capillaries. Whatever was leaked out, because it was small enough to be leaked out of the pores will end in this capsule. And if you are in the capsule, your only way out will be through this system of tubules. You see that? Now, while this tubular fluid is going through the system of tubules, it is modified. This right here is convoluted, is coiled up, and can you notice that this segment right here is proximal to where the blood was filtered? How do you believe this is named? This is the proximal convoluted tubule. Here you have another coiled up, but this is the one that's distant from where the blood was filtered. So this is the distal convoluted and here you have something that descends so this is the descending limb this is ascending now this is the ascending limb because whatever was 
tilted out, we'll go to the proximal bubble of the tubule, then you do descend, and then you do ascend. So this is the descending limb, and this is the ascending limb, and together, this is what we call loop of Henley. Are we good so far? If we have very, very good stuff in this filtrate that was very unlucky to be filtered out, like glucose, our body needs glucose. And it is small, so if it is small, it will leak out of the capillaries, but we need glucose. The first thing our body will do is to reabsorb that. You don't want to have the glucose just wandering around throughout the nephron. You want to suck it back up as fast as possible. So when you look at the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule, which is the one that's proximal to where the blood was filtered, you see lots of microvilli. Why would you see microvilli? Because you need to increase the reabsorption, right? You need to reabsorb whatever was leaked out. Does that make sense? So the first step that happens in urine production is filtration. After that, what do you do? You reabsorb as soon as possible whatever was leaked out. And then the third step is, okay, we have stuff that was big and could not be leaked out because it was big, so we dump it in. And then you have the third step as the tubular secretion. So the first step is filtration, <laughs> then you have reabsorption, and lastly, you have the secretion into the tubules, so it can leave your body. Are we good so far? Yes? Now, if you're going down here, you reabsorb, good stuff, and then the tube, whatever is within this tubule will go down the descending limb. Now what happens is that the descending limb has lots of pores that lets water to get out. So you have leakage of water because the descending limb is permeable. So water can leave the tube because you have water here in the filtrate. So it will leak out. Now, can water just leak out? No, you need to have something that will cause the water to be sucked out. So you need to create a osmotic gradient. And what creates the osmotic gradient is that here in the ascending limb, you have lots and lots and lots of pumps that they use energy, active pumps. And these active pumps in the ascending limb, they will be pumping sodium and chloride ions out. So if you have lots of sodium and chloride ions pumped out in the ascending limb, these ions right here will create the osmotic gradient that will suck the water out in the descending limb. Because you need to remember that this is constantly happening. It's not like it goes here and then it's empty and then goes there. No, it's constantly happening. So you have the ions being pumped out here using lots and lots of energy to pump out ions here. And the presence of these ions all around this nephron will create the osmotic gradient that will suck the water out in the descending limb. As the filtrate goes down the descending limb, since this is permeable to water, can you notice that you have less and less water, but you have lots of sodium, so you are making the filtrate very, very concentrated. And then as it goes up, you are decreasing the solute, so it becomes less concentrated, but now with a very low volume as well. Does this make sense? <laughs> yes? And then, when we have this filtrate reaching right here, the distal convoluted tubule, is when we can have the secretion dumping all this stuff that could not be filtered out here into the last segment of the nephron. So, 
the step back, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and lastly, the tubular secretion. Are we good so far? Yes. Guys, this is a nephro. This right here is not nephrom anymore. These are all tubules. This right here is connecting, connecting the tubules from the nephrons to this big thing that collects from them all. So you have the connecting tubule. This segment is the connecting tubule. Connecting to the collecting duct. And the collecting duct receives the filtrate from several nephrons because it's collecting from them all. The connecting tubule and the collecting duct, they are not part of the nephron. They are part of the collecting system. Does that make sense? Are we good? The distal convoluted tubule can be under hormonal control. A hormone, for example, the antidiuretic hormone, ADH, antidiuresis, it prevents you from urinating. So it prevents you from releasing lots of urine, which means that you are keeping volume, so liquid, within your body. Antidiuresis. Now, for this to happen, you need to have a way, antidiuresis, to keep more water within this, the body. Because we know if the tubular fluid goes all the way down here, and then it reaches the renal papilla, and then you have here the minor calyx, we don't modify anything. Because this is where we can only first say that urine is urine. So, what happens is that the antidiuretic hormone that's released by the pituitary gland under the control of the hypothalamus, when we have this hormone in the blood, if you come and put water pores in the distal convoluted tubule, which is part of the nephron, and water pores are named aqua porin. And also the ADH will cause the aquaporins to be open here in the connecting tubule and also in the collecting duct. Now, if you have aquaporins in the distal convoluted tubule, connecting tubule, and the collecting duct, water can leak out and then you are modifying this fluid. And that's why we cannot call urine urine unless it is in the minor calyx. So if I ask you, what parts of the nephron are under the control of the antidiuretic hormone? What would be the answer? Distal convoluted tubule. What part of the collecting system that can be under the antidiuretic hormone? Connecting tubule and collecting duct. Where is the first part? that we can call urine, urine, minor calyx, because we can have this tubular fluid modified until it reaches the minor calyx, because of these hormones. Does that make sense? Can you notice that we have this water here and these ions? Yes? Guys, what? This is outside the nephron. So if you have it there, you need to have a way to put that back in the bloodstream. There is no way you just have it there. So what happens is that this inferent arteriole that you see there, it will basically become capillaries that will surround here or sometimes, depending if this loop of handling is very long, it can go straight down. We have capillaries surrounding that. And we need capillaries there to suck back in what we remove from the tubules of the nephron and the collecting duct. Now, when we have this surrounding, the 
scapulars that are surrounding the loop of Henle, we can have them as peritubular capillaries. They are capillaries in the periphery of the tubules. Or we can have what we call vasa recta, which is this one that I drew like this. But vasa recta is just present in nephrons that have a very, very, very long nephron loop. So let's just draw, draw another um, nephron right here. Let's see, let me put, no. Let's just do another one here. Can you see both, both of them? So you have here, let's make another nephron. So you have the proximal convoluted tubule, and after the proximal convoluted tubule, what's the part of the nephron? Descending limb, and then you have the ascending limb, and then the distal convoluted tubule. Are we good? So that's the nephron. Now, can you notice that this one has a much higher, much longer loop of Henle than this one? And this longer loop of Henle then is surrounded by, instead of having the peritubular capillaries like it has in the short one, this long one has a, a, tubo, a, a capillary that's going straight down like recta, and that's why this is called vasa recta. And these capillaries is there to suck back all that was pumped out of the tubules. When we looked at this one, we said that water would leak out going down and then potassium, sodium and chloride would be pumped out when it goes up. So this would be concentrated in the urine. You see that? Which nephron would concentrate more, this or this? This one. So this is the one